So now uh, what we will cover today, first of all, very briefly talk about why you might want to support insects in your landscape. And I, I believe I'm probably preaching to the choir here, so I won't talk about that very much. Uh, but secondly, how do insects survive the winter? And then I'll give you some examples of insect species that do spend the winter in various life stages, as eggs, as immatures, adults. And I want to give you some more details on native bees, because I think there's some misconceptions and a lot of interest in supporting native bees. And then talk a little bit about stem borers, which are not well known, perhaps. And along the way, with these examples, you'll get some hints about where insects overwinter and what the necessary resources are. And then I'll uh, turn more specifically to what you can do to support life in your landscape year round and especially in the winter. So first of all, why would you want to support insects in your landscape? Uh, I think we're all aware that pollinators on the, are on the decline. Uh, beginning with reports of colony collapse in honeybees, but then also as people looked at it, declines in native bee populations, mostly solitary native bees, have also been substantial. And of course, pollination is very, very important, both for supporting crop species, but also for our native plants uh, and, and flowers. Secondly, the insect apocalypse has been in the news for the last decade or so. The original German report was that there had been a 75% drop in terrestrial insects in a certain area of Germany where it had been monitored in 27 years. And since that report, people have looked at this at other places, and that's probably on the high side in terms of the amount of decline. But just this morning, I saw a report of a series of papers in PNAS, insect decline in the Anthropocene death by a thousand cuts. And uh, the executive summary suggested that there have been annual declines worldwide of one or 2% per year, which may sound low, but then that's 10 to 20% per decade. So it's of concern. So why are we concerned about drop in insect numbers? Well, they're very valuable as food for birds, other wildlife, in addition to their ecosystem services, as I mentioned before. Uh, and indeed, bird populations have also declined by about 3 billion in the last 50 years in North America. So if you are concerned about birds, you should be concerned about insects. Uh, our friend and my former colleague, Doug Tallamy, has written several books that I hope all of you have read. They're wonderful books. And Doug's uh, main contention is that native insects require native plants. And certainly we have a lot, a lot of good data uh, supporting that. And so you can, you can plant native plants, and I hope you will, but what about the rest of the life cycle? How do insects survive the winter? Now, there are a few species that fly south for the winter. They migrate, just like our migratory birds. Probably the best known is the monarch butterfly. Certainly during the summer, you can plant milkweed, and the caterpillars will feed on milkweed. But then in the fall, from our area, uh, the monarch butterfly will fly south to a particular area down in Mexico. And um, this overwintering site was actually only discovered in 1975. So uh, very, very um, crucial uh, behavior. There are other migrating insects, including some of our common butterflies, the buckeye butterfly. And uh, the picture of the buckeye butterfly on the left, that was taken by me, and you can tell that by the date at the bottom, uh, far more uh, professional photograph on the right. And I've tried to identify the photographers in the lower right of all these pictures. Uh, similarly, the cloudless sulfur butterfly, this is one that feels, fe feeds on wild senna and some of its relatives. And I took this lovely picture of this um, beautiful yellow caterpillar feeding on senna. But then in the fall, you might see these uh, yellowish, greenish yellow uh, butterflies fluttering about, and indeed they're migrating. This is how they spend the winter as well. Uh, as we've studied migration in, in insects, we found that partial migration is quite common. So a part of the population will move south and the rest will try to, to spend the winter in place and what we think they're doing is they're hedging their bets. If we happen to have a relatively mild winter, 
then the ones that spend the winter will survive. But if it's a very severe winter with uh, long periods of, of uh, very low temperatures, then the population can come back in the following fall. Uh, tracking insects can be a problem, as you see in the, the slide on the right. There are some radio trackers that we can put on large uh, insects such as dragonflies, but smaller ones really can't be tracked in that way. What we have found though, is if you put nets and the like on uh, airplanes, you find a lot of insects up at high altitudes, and this has been called aerial plankton. We don't really know what it's doing, but part of it probably has to do with migration. Now you can support migrating species with late blooming flowers. So flowers such as asters, goldenrods, um, giant hyssop, which blooms for a very long period of time into the fall will support migrating insects as they make their way south. Now most insects, however, overwinter in place in what's called diapause. So diapause is actually a physiological syndrome they stop reproducing if they're in the adult stage. They reduce the amount of water in their cells. And the reason they do that is because a cell with water, uh, if it freezes, then the cell will burst. So that can cause death. They add a tremendous amount of fat in fat bodies. And uh, sometimes you'll see insects in the fall just uh, eating away, just like bears preparing for hibernation. They produce specific glycerol compounds, which in some cases are exactly the same as the antifreeze that we put in our cars. And what that does is it reduces the freezing point uh, for water in their bodies. So again, preventing freezing. And then it's also a behavioral syndrome. They move to a particular place where they're protected for the entire winter, both from wind and cold temperatures if they can, but specifically for predators, because things like birds are still going to be active in the winter. Now, diapause can occur at any life stage, but it's almost always the same life stage for all members of a given species. So what do I mean by life stages? Well, looking at the left here, some insects have simple metamorphosis, where they basically have three life stages, the fertilized egg, which hatches out into the nymphal stage. The nymphs then go through usually three to five molts until they grow to the adult stage, the final molt. The adult looks similar to the nymphs. Many of our common insects, um, however, have complete metamorphosis, illustrated here with a butterfly, but also found in beetles, in bees, ants, wasps, and flies, some of our largest orders. So here we have an adult again. The adult will lay a fertilized egg. The egg here hatches out into the larval form. So instead of a nymph that looks essentially like the adult grasshopper, we have a larva that looks very different from the adult. Again, the larva goes through usually three to five uh, stages before it emerges as the pupa. And the pupa is the stage where metamorphosis takes place this remarkable uh, situation where it goes from a worm-like creature to an adult butterfly. And so again, here we have four main stages and diapause occurs in any of those stages depending on the species. Now, if insects have one generation per year, in other words, they only go through that life stage once in the course usually of a season, then whenever that stage that goes into diapause occurs, it's kind of automatically in diapause. So the spotted lanternfly is one that unfortunately has become quite familiar to us in the last year or two. Here at this time of year, we have eggs and those eggs are in diapause. They won't hatch out until next year and uh, in, in the spring. And at that point they'll hatch, they'll go through several instars and then the adult will come out in the fall lay its eggs, which again will be automatically in diapause. Insects have more than one generation per year, however, have to figure out when is it time to go into diapause. We might have an adult that comes out in June and then another adult that comes out in August in two different generations. And they have to know when it's the appropriate time to go into diapause. 
This has been studied extensively, especially in pest species, as you can imagine. Uh, many, many scientists have put many insects in many growth chambers with different lengths of daylight. Uh, daylight. And what we found is that diapause is usually triggered by shortening day lengths. So if you look at this graph here, you'll see the number of daylight hours in blue in Wilmington, Delaware. So now in January, we have 9.7 uh, on average um, hours of daylight. This goes up rapidly, thankfully. February 10, March 12, all the way up to June, where it reaches a maximum of 15 hours. After that, it starts to go down. So by September, it's all the way down to 12. And uh, most insects which have been studied have been shown to have a critical photo period where they, whatever is produced after that period in terms of insects in the appropriate life stage will be in diapause. So they start their behavioral activity, they're feeding, they're putting on of fat bodies and so on. So for example, it might be 12 hours of light. If the light is going down from 13 to 12 to 11, then they'll all go into di diapause in September. So this is generally the way that, that insects know it's time for diapause to occur. This has also been shown to be modified by temperature. So if we have a particularly cool August and September, it might happen earlier and also especially food quality. Because if an insect feeds on plants, the quality of their food is gonna go down rapidly in the fall as well. So the how of overwintering is quite well understood. They go into diapause or in some cases they migrate. The where, however, not so much. Uh, this nice quote here is from an article in 2014 that describes trying to find the overwintering uh, stage of brown marmorated stink bugs in natural landscapes. And as they point out, sampling overwinter insects in natural landscapes is often very challenging. They're small, they're concealed in the context of complex environments. So it's not necessarily known where they spend the winter, even with pest species. So for example, the Colorado potato beetle is a very serious pest of potato. And this is one that I worked on uh, for a while during my uh, research career. The adults seen here, they're very quite large and colorful. It was known that they would, at, in the fall, dig into the soil down about four or five inches, uh, late summer into fall, and then spend the entire winter there. It was assumed that this all happened under potato plants because that's where we saw it happen. But come to find out in the 1980s, uh, this was studied in great detail in, uh, at UMass, uh, Amherst, and they found that, in fact, a very large percentage of the population flew out of the field in the fall and uh, overwintered at the drip line uh, of uh, trees in a forested area. So, you know, we may not even know where some of our important pest species spend the winter. Nevertheless, I'm going to tell you what we do know. Um, some examples of insects that will overwinter in the egg stage. Most of the grasshoppers and crickets, certainly in our area, lay their eggs in the soil. And this grasshopper you can see has its ovipositor or its abdomen dug into the soil. And if you look on the right here, you can see that they have quite an effective digging apparatus. So usually they only have one generation per year. They lay their eggs in the fall and the eggs just stay in the soil throughout the winter. I mentioned the spotted lanternfly I did, did want to mention this again. You see that these two photographs were taken by Jim White. Jim is, Jim is probably somebody you know from, many of you at least, from the Delaware Nature Society where he's employed as a naturalist and he's a wonderful photographer. When I started putting this talk together, I asked him if he had any pictures of insects in winter because I really didn't have too many. And he sent me about 35 of them. So uh, you'll, see, you'll see more as this talk uh, progresses. But again, all of these eggs are in diapause throughout the winter. Another example, praying mantids. The egg cases of praying mantids are actually quite obvious. Uh, if you look on the left here, they're attached to twigs. And in the case of the Chinese mantis, which is unfortunately our most common praying mantid at this point, they're kind of globular. And if you see them, they're quite obvious. 
Uh, there are a couple other species. There's the Carolina mantis, show, uh, mantis shown on the right here. It's more uh, long and thin with a dark stripe on it. And then there's also European uh, mantid. But again, all of the egg cases are present throughout the winter. Bagworms, another interesting species that spends the winter in the uh, egg case, uh, in the egg stage. The case shown here on the right, again, one of Jim White's uh, photographs, doesn't really look like an insect at all. But what happens is the caterpillar will make that case in the course of the summer, and it will uh, get larger and larger. They have one generation per year. The females are wingless, and they stay in the bag. At the end of the summer, they attach the bag to the, a twig and lay their eggs in the bag. And so again, the eggs will spend the winter. Excuse me, Judy. Yeah. Um, Peggy had a question. Um, I'm not sure whether she was referring to the mantis or the um, bag worms, but she wondered how large their egg cases were. Uh, the mantis egg cases, I would say, are about an inch in diameter. And bagworms vary in size depending um, on what they've been feeding on, but they're pretty large, about two inches long or so. So if you find one, you know it. Uh, I wanted to throw in spiders uh, because even though they're not insects, they do also produce egg sacs. And typically the egg sac will be the overwintering stage in spiders, either with eggs in it, or in some cases they hatch into tiny little spiderlings which are present all winter long. So you may see these as well. Should we, if you see a native mantis egg case, should you keep it or destroy it? Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's a matter of, of opinion. I mean, certainly. I'm, I'm sorry, a non-native mantis. Yeah, the non-native Chinese mantid. Uh, I certainly have heard Doug Tallamy say that he would not mind destroying all the Chinese mantids. I kind of like them. I think they're really cool. So, um, but certainly they have outcompeted our native mantids. They're also, although people think of them as biological control because they eat insects, they're they're very much of a generalist feeder, and they'll feed on beneficial and pest insects alike. So, it's up to you. It's not against the law, however, to kill a mantid. That used to be a, an old wives' tale that people would believe. And one question on bagworms, will they come back in the spring? Yes, well, what happens is those eggs then will hatch into larvae and the larvae will crawl out of, out of the bag. Yeah, and they'll start feeding on, on leaves. So if they seem to be causing damage to a specimen tree, you wanna pick those bags and destroy them in the winter. So now insects that overwinter as larvae a pretty well-known example is the woolly bear caterpillar, this, this fuzzy orange and black caterpillar, which is thought to predict the severity of the winter, but doesn't. Uh, although it may say something about what happened during the, the course of the spring in terms of humidity and, and food. Uh, in any case, this woolly bear caterpillar has two generations per year. The uh, rather nondescript moth is sh shown on the right. The second generation, uh, the caterpillars feed on leaves of a variety of different species. And then in the fall, you'll frequently see these large uh, orange and black caterpillars just scurrying across uh, various paths uh, and into wherever you don't know where they're going. Uh, but where they're going, in fact, is to try to find some protected area where they can spend the winter. So they're full of fat bodies, they're uh, nicely in diapause, and as soon as they curl up in something like this dead tree as shown in the middle here, uh, they will spend the winter. If we could go back just briefly to the Chinese mantis, we had another question. Um, have the Chinese mantis been seen eating lantern flies? <laughs> you know, I did hear somebody report that. I haven't seen it myself, but yes. So maybe we should keep them around, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just for that. And it is larger than the other mantids, for sure. Uh, okay, there are some other butterflies. Um, oh, okay. I'm informed that the top of my head is missing when I lean forward like that. So <laughs> I'll try to stay back. 
there are other insects that feed that overwinter as caterpillars, and one of the common ones in our area is the pearl crescent butterfly. This is an insect that feeds on asters, and although I have asters, I've never seen the caterpillars. I'm going to take a careful look this, uh, this summer. Uh, apparently, the caterpillars are expert hiders. They also go through several generations. The butterflies, they're small, but they're quite attractive, as you can see, and they have different morphs. Some of them are darker, some are lighter in uh, color. The third instar caterpillars overwinter. So again, when they get to the third instar, as shown in the lower right, probably won't see them, but chances are they're probably uh, finding a place in the leaf litter underneath your asters to spend the winter. Now, we, turning to insects with simple metamorphosis, there aren't too many examples of uh, nymphs that overwinter. However, if you look at aquatic nymphs, so these are the immatures of insects that have simple metamorphosis, uh, dragonflies and damselflies typically do overwinter, at least in some species, in the nymphal stage. So you can see here on the left, uh, the nymphs of dragonflies are all aquatic, as are the nymphs of damsels fly, flies shown on the right. Uh, this picture was taken by Jim White, uh, again of Dave Funk of the Stroud Water Research Center last March. The two of them went out to find out what they could find in water in March. And the, the water around here, there, it may be a case that the top of the ponds or streams freezes but the bottom of the, the pond certainly will not be frozen. And uh, indeed, what they found last March, they found this nice damselfly nymph, this interesting looking dragonfly nymph, which is in a species known as the dragon hunter. So, and various other nymphs of various other aquatic insects are also in water all winter long. There are many insects that overwinter in the pupal stage, including many of our butterflies, Butterflies, for example, the black swallowtail, which is quite common here. Uh, if you uh, grow parsley or related plants, such as even dill or fennel in your garden, you probably have seen these caterpillars. Uh, I took this nice picture in September a couple of years ago where I had a really nice harvest of caterpillars, uh, black swallowtail. I usually let them go so that they will form their chrysalids and the beautiful butterfly shown on the left. Uh, they will feed on parsley down to the nubbin, but once they leave to go uh, into the chrysalid stage, the uh, parsley often comes back. So I don't consider them a pest. Others might. Many moths also overwinter in the pupal stage. Often in cocoons, for example, on the left, you see a cecropia moth cocoon. And these are right out in the open, but they certainly blend in well. Uh, they're covered with a silk that the caterpillar has spun around them. Uh, the beautiful moth is shown on the right. This is one of our largest silk moths. Polyphemus moths also overwinter in the pupal stage, again, in cocoons that are spun on their host tree, another one of our lovely big silk moths. Many, cocoon, many uh, moths, however, spin their cocoons down in the leaf litter. So uh, you can see an example here. So underneath trees, if there are leaves present, and they'll find a nice uh, hidden place. The luna moth is kind of interesting. At least at times, the caterpillars, which are feeding on tree leaves, will actually wrap themselves in fresh leaves. And you can see the, the green leaves in the lower right here. Uh, they'll spin their cocoon, again, producing silk from the last instar of the caterpillar. The, the leaves in this case are not attached to twigs, as with the polyphemus. So they fall to the ground in the autumn, and of course these leaves turn brown and they're very difficult to see. Other moths no, will overwinter as so-called naked pupae. In other words, there's no cocoon. And again, on, on or in the ground, hidden by leaves, leaf litter in forests, or even dug into the ground. Uh, here's another one of Jim's uh, photographs on the right. Uh, the, the characteristically black banded stinks moth pupa in the winter. The hummingbird moth, a very common one around here, is the snowberry clearwing. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. Shown in my garden on the right, they flit about just like 
hummingbirds, tiny hummingbirds, about an inch or so long. They have two generations per year. They pupate in the leaf litter or soil surface. As shown on the left, a thin cocoon spun at the soil surface. And again, the naked, almost naked pupa. Uh, just briefly, there are some very interesting beetles in Delaware, stag beetles, several species found in Delaware. The larvae feed on decaying wood and the, uh, they pupate again for the winter in small chambers in the soil near the food source. And you can see these nice pictures of pupae. Those are actually the pupae. They, got, they look quite different from uh, the pupae of caterpillar of, of butterflies and moss. Uh, you can actually see the, uh, the legs and even the mandibles covered in white. But again, they pupate and spend the winter in the pupal stage. I have, we have a couple of questions. Sure. All of a sudden, maybe we can get those in. Okay. Um, one, go, going back to the, um, the asters being attacked and decimated, okay. uh, one of Karen Barker said that they had had their asters totally decimated in two years ago, and she wondered if that species was native. Yes, yes, it is a native species. Okay. So I, I don't know of anything else that would have decimated them. I haven't seen a lot of damage myself from them, but it, you know. <laughs> so then another question, do aquatic pupae survive a deep freeze? Typically they would be in the nymphal stage and there's no pupal stage with insects that have simple metamorphosis. They, uh, the nymphs would probably not survive a deep freeze if the entire pond froze. But in more northerly areas, what they do is they dig their, themselves into the mud at the bottom of a lake. So if it's a fall lake or pond that freezes all the way through, they could still survive if they're adapted to being, um, to being there in the winter and they'll be dug into the mud at the bottom. Oh, and here's another question is what time frame is best to shred leaves in the fall in order not to kill insects who are overwintering in leaf litter? Okay, well, we'll get to that at the end when I talk about specifically how to treat your landscape. Okay, and another question is the hummingbird moth the adult stage of the tomato hornworm? No, it is not. No, the caterpillars of hummingbird moths do look a bit like hornworms, but no, it's completely different. They, they're not, it's not the same species that feeds on um, tomatoes. So you can kill those. <laughs> All right, uh, insects that overwinter as adults, uh, unfortunately, some of our uh, non-native pest species, such as the brown mar marmorated stink bug, attempt to come into your office here, as Jim has kindly shown, shown me at Ashland Nature Center, or in your home, and they try to spend the winter in your home. Now, um, if it makes you feel any better, they usually don't do too well in homes over the winter because it's typically too dry for them. So they, they desiccate unless they can find a place that's protected and at a higher humidity in most homes. I mentioned at the beginning uh, this paper in 2014 where they went out looking for brown marmorated stink bug adults over winter in nature. They did eventually find them after you know, probably many grad student hours of looking. And where they found them was on standing dead trees under the bark in aggregations, as shown in the slides on the right. Uh, they also looked in leaf litter under trees. They didn't find any brown marmorated stink bugs, but they did find six native stink bug species in leaf litter. So again, the value of leaf litter. Uh, Boxel elder bugs. Now these are native species, uh, native species, but they also can be quite annoying as they come uh, congregating in the fall, looking for protected overwintering sites if they happen to come into your home. Uh, out in nature, though, they do feed on box elder leaves um, and diapause as adults. There are even some butterflies that spend the winter in the adult stage. And this is always surprising to me because they seem so delicate as butterfly adults. But in fact, the morning cloak butterfly is one that's quite well known. It has one generation per year. So the adults always go into diapause. And if you look on the left here, 
This looks like a root ball, perhaps. But if you look more closely, you can see that, oh, sure enough, there's a butterfly there with its wings closed. It blends in quite nicely. That's an overwintering uh, morning cloak. <clears throat> the picture on the lower uh, right, taken by Jim White on a May 1st, this is a butterfly that obviously has spent the winter and is the worst for wear. Uh, the upper right um, butterfly is, is much more uh, pristine, so it must have been taken in the fall, I'm not sure. So this nice chart was uh, put together by the National Wildlife Federation and shows the winter habits of some of our common butterfly and moth species. And just to reiterate, for any particular species, there's always a particular life stage. So on the left, um, insects, butterflies that spend the winter in the caterpillar stage, not just the one I showed, the, the, um, the woolly bear, but also the, and the pearl crescent, but the viceroy, for instance, a common monarch mimic and uh, many others. Um, many butterflies I mentioned uh, spend the winter in the chrysalid and many moss spend the winter in a cocoon or as a naked pupa. Uh, others are listed here. And then it's not just the morning cloak, but also uh, the question mark and uh, pictures that I took from the fall of last year of the Eastern comma, also small but lovely butterfly that's native here. And some adult insects can be found frolicking on the snow. And uh, we don't get a lot of snow here, but Jim shared these with me. Um, there are springtail species, and we have two species shown here, plus uh, a slide of what the snow looks like from, it looks like it's covered with little black dots. Those are springtails, particular um, snow springtail species. The snow scorpion fly can also be found, winter crane flies, winter stone flies, and they're not obviously in a very um, complete diapause where they're not moving, but because you can see them out on the snow sometimes. Now I want to talk a little bit about social insects. There are relatively few species of truly social insects, but according to E.O. Wilson, they make up about 75% of insect biomass. So very important and very interesting. All the ants and termites are social. Some of our bees, honeybees, bumblebees, are social, completely social, and some of our wasps as well. So some typical characteristics of a social insect, they live together in a colony. They typically, not always, but usually have one queen who's a fertile female. And you can see in this little cross section of an ant nest here, it's the really big uh, ant there that's the queen and she lays eggs. Uh, you have many sterile females known as workers that care for the young and then they only produce males as needed for new queens to mate with. So social insects that have perennial nests, meaning the nest goes on year after year, such as ants or honeybees, it's generally the adults that overwinter. So if you see ants in the summer and then all of a sudden they're gone, what they do is they go deep into the soil uh, or sometimes they go to protected areas. For example, this nice picture here that Jim sent, a cluster of ferruginous carpenter ants under a cover board but typically the adult stage. Similarly with honeybees. Honeybees, they pretty much stop rearing young in the winter. The adults will cluster together to stay warm, as shown here. And they'll, they'll be feeding a little bit on honey. That's why they make honey, is to spend the winter, not for us to take and use. Um, so people who rear honeybees, they have to leave them some honey for the winter. and. Uh, pretty much only the adult stages then. There are also a lot of social insects that have annual nests, meaning they're just there for the summer and then they're gone. We have a number of species of bumblebees that are very important pollinators, important, mostly native species. Also yellow jackets, we won't talk about them. But uh, in this case, it's only the new queens, which are mated females that spend the winter. And you may see them in the fall uh, as shown on the left here, this, this poor little bumblebee queen looking for a protected place to spend the winter. Now here we see uh, the three stages of bumblebees in the middle and you can see the queen on the bottom is quite a bit larger than the workers. Uh, typically then the queen in the spring when she comes out of her overwintering uh, stage 
or look for a place to start a new nest. A typical place for them to nest would be pre-existing cavities such as abandoned rodent dens. Also holes in dead logs can be used. Very important for them to have early flowers and late flowers, early because when these queens emerge from overwintering, they really need some sustenance to get them started uh, and to keep them going as they rear their first set of workers. When they come out, it's just them. They have to find a nest, they have to start laying eggs, they have to provision the eggs with pollen and nectar. And then once they rear the first set of workers, the workers do all the work and they just stay there and, and uh, lay their eggs. Late in the season, this bumblebee nest uh, is going to start producing new queens. So these sterile workers will still be there, but the queen will start laying eggs that are then groomed and reared so that they're new queens. Also males will be produced and the new queens will mate and then prepare for overwintering. Again, they need to uh, eat some, uh, some good nectar. They need a good nectar source to prepare for wintering. There are also a lot of other native species that are not social typically, or in some cases they're semi-social or pre-social. There are said to be 4,000 species in the US. Um, a lot of these are not well studied. We think we have about 300 or 400 species in our area. So a lot is not known. They are being studied more and more in the last decade or so uh, in several areas. What we know about them at this point, about 70% of them nest in the soil. So on the right here, you see a, a cross section of a typical nest. Now, depending on the species, the nest can look different, but generally what happens is a single female will dig a nest She'll make a little side chamber and provision it with a pollen ball, so-called, which is a combination of pollen and nectar, just enough to support one bee from egg to pupa. And so that she lays one egg then on that pollen ball. Then she goes out, she collects another pollen ball, makes another uh, little chamber, and lays another egg. She continues this until uh, all her eggs are depleted. And she then dies off. And some of these bees are very specific. They may only appear as adults when their particular flower is available. So you, you may see small um, native bees all summer long, but chances are they'll be in different species at different times of year. The offspring spend the whole year then, the winter and all the way until it's time for the adult to come out in the soil, in their nest. Again, depending on the species, they may be pre pupae they may be pupae, or they may be adults, either both sexes or mated females. Uh, it depends on the species, but within one species, it's one stage or the other. And then in the spring, the adult females emerge and they start the process again, digging new burrows. So I made a point here, they need bare ground, no thick mulch. So keep that in mind if you think you might have ground nesting native bees. The other 30% of native bee species nest in cavities, such as hollow stems or holes in dead wood. And in this case, they create brood chambers similar to what the ground nesters do. But as you can see in the picture on the left here, they start at the bottom of, of the tube, whatever it may be, if it's a stem as it is here, it would be the bottom of the stem. Again, they collect a pollen ball, they lay one egg on it. It's just enough there for one insect to develop. They seal off that chamber and go on to the next one. And looking at this picture, it's such a lovely picture. It looks like the second one, for some reason, the egg didn't survive because it looks like there's still a, a pollen ball there. But then the third chamber here, you have a nice big fat larva. And the fourth chamber, you have a smaller larva. So during the course of the summer, when she's done laying her eggs, she seals this off. And again, those uh, uh, insects continue to develop and then spend the entire winter either in the pupa or the adult stage. The new adults then will emerge. Now on the right, you see a little bee coming out of a stem. Uh, they, they might come out of the side like that, depending on the species, or they might just come out of the end one at a time. So we have a lot of nice native plants that have pithy or hollow stems. Uh, this nice picture from the Maryland Department of Natural Resources highlights 
Many of the native plants that many of us grow in our gardens, purple coneflower, blazing star, goldenrod, and so on, these all have either pithy or hollow stems. But one thing you have to uh, realize is that for native bees that use stems, they actually use the dried stems from the previous year's growth. So just leaving the stems out, you probably don't have bees in them if they're current year's growth. The recommended timeline, and this, this comes from the University of Minnesota where they have a very extensive bee lab. Uh, in the winter, again, do leave those dead perennial stalks standing. In the spring, when you cut them back, don't, don't cut them back all the way to the base though, cut them back to varying heights because different species of bees like different lengths of tubes. Uh, they recommend from eight to 24 inches. And then the female bees, as they come out, the various species will create brood chambers and seal off the nest. During the summer, then your, your new perennial growth will hide those cutback stems, provide a nice protected area and also nectar and pollen. As I mentioned, in some cases, very specific species are needed Obviously these bees need nectar and pollen to provision their young. And then in the fall and the winter, the new bees will be diapaused and they'll emerge the following spring. And what about bee hotels? Bee hotels provide cavities in the form of holes in wood. And certainly that's also an area where cavity nesting bees will accept and use uh, to rear their young. However, um, if you do put up a bee hotel, you really should replace it every couple of years because what happens if these tubes are re reused year after year, you tend to get a buildup of pathogens, bee pathogens and mites. And the, the insects will come back and use them. Now, if you think about what they're doing in the wild, if they're using stems, by the second year, those stems have pretty much, much disintegrated. And even if you're, they're using holes in dead wood, that dead wood will disintegrate more quickly than this beautiful hand hued um, bee hotel. So um, a better and more recommended way, uh, according to the Xerces Society, which is the premier society for insect conservation, would be to collect, put a collection of hollow stems or pithy stems hang them in a sheltered location as shown here. Over the winter, make a new collection each year and hang it next to the old one. And you'll see on the right here, the old one, you can see some of them are still sealed off. Some of them, the bee adults have emerged. Once most of them have emerged, remove that old nest and discard it. And then you'll have new nests uh, that don't have any kind of pathogens in them. Um, 2D question. How do you know when the bees have emerged and how often do you need to check and what do you look for? Yeah, well, it is. Okay, here, here's my cursor. You can see these have not emerged yet because they're uh, sealed off with uh, some kind of mud, it looks like. These have emerged. So you want to look for a place where if they're sealed off, you can see that they've um, taken that material off. Uh, there are other stems here. So this one looks like it never did have bees in them. So they're not going to use all of them. Uh, but so, you know, take a look at the appropriate time of year, every couple of days, maybe take a look and see if those seals have been broken. Now, in some cases, these may never emerge because there was a pathogen or something. So what you can do is take that old bundle and put it in a protected area where it's away from the garden itself, so it's less likely to be reused. But if there's anything left there, they, they can come out. Is there a resource for how far back we should cut particular natives, about seven inches high? And Well, as I mentioned, the, the bee lab at Minnesota, they recommend varying lengths, eight to 24 inches. The bee being the different, different bee species prefer uh different lengths. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, and Anne had, this is the question from her. She had a bee hotel last summer near their natives that was about seven inches high, but no one used it. Any suggestions to make it hospitable? It was brand new. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't know. That, that seems a little bit low, maybe. I, 
but I, I'm really not sure, you know, maybe in the, a protected area, I, I'm, I'm really not sure what they're looking for. And sometimes it just has to be trial and error since there's so many species and a lot of them have not been studied. And um, what would the appropriate time of the year for them to emerge be? Well, as I mentioned, that depends on the species. A lot of them do emerge in the spring. So, you know, perhaps April, May. Some of them may not emerge till later though. All right. Um, and then is bundling the better than just letting them remain where they're growing? No, I think it's probably best to let them remain where they're growing. And that's the natural situation. But if for some reason you don't, you want to enhance the population, they, they seem to be limited by uh, stems, then you can try the bundling. And it's also kind of fun to watch them be used. Uh, by the way, you do need to close off the end, one end of those stems, though, because otherwise it won't be a good place for them to, they'll see that it's open on both ends and they can't use it. So, um, and back to the other question, I guess I read that as seven inches, but it's seven feet high that B Hotel was. Um, oh. Seven feet off the ground, which that seems kind of high. <laughs> okay. Maybe try lowering it down. Okay, thank okay. you. All right, now this on the right, this sequence of pictures was um, put up in a blog put up by Hummingbird Hill Native Plant Nursery. Maybe some of you saw it, uh, where she sh they show uh, different stems with holes in them. And again, these are our pithy native plants, many of them that we have in our gardens. And so the question is, what is in them? And unfortunately, it's hard to, to answer that question. It certainly is possible that bees made their way in there and that these are where the adults came out. Um, there's also the possibility of stem borers. There are many, many stem borers. Uh, they're very abundant, but they're little studied. And um, one that's very common is the jewelweed stem borer. The, um, Jewelweed shown on the left, very common uh, native plant that has very kind of pithy, almost hollow stems. In the fall, if you cut these open, you'll very, very often find a little caterpillar in there. And this is the jewelweed stem borer. The adult is shown in the upper right, very uh, small, nondescript looking moth. Uh, they are uh, very common. I know I've taken my class out looking for stem borers, and usually about half of the stems will have them in there. We really don't know how they overwinter or what they do or you know, what their life history is. Um, they're thought to overwinter as pupae near the base of stems. That would make sense because the stem might not make it through the winter, and that would be, again, a nice protected area. There was one study that I know of in the 1970s of stem borers in native prairie plants. And what this person was, she clipped stems at ground level of a whole variety of native, native prairie plants growing in the wild. And this was out in the Midwest, but they're the same species that we find in the Mid-Atlantic largely. Uh, in August and September of over two years, she found 48 different species of larval insects living in stems as stem borers. And they're from four orders. So I talked about caterpillars, I talked about bees, there are also beetles and there are flies that make their living in, in stems. She found them on 33 different plant species, almost all native, and most of them couldn't be identified to species, at least in the immature stage. So, you know, I wish we knew more about them. We don't. Most of them preferred large stems. Some of them were very host specific. Others could be found on different species. Um, they may make little holes when they crawl out as adults. We don't really know, possibly, when they go in. Uh, they certainly are a resource. They don't all make it through. Uh, you see birds poking at stems sometimes, and there are parasitoids and the like that feed on them. So that's all, about all I can tell you about stem borers, but they're, they're there. Now, turning now to what you should and shouldn't do, again, uh, there have been various hints in the course of this talk. Certainly the traditional fall cleanup is not something that you wanna do. So at one time it was recommended you rake and remove all the leaves from your lawn and your garden beds, cut all your perennial stems back to ground level, 
cover your beds with a thick layer of mulch. And from what I've said so far, you can imagine that this is going to pretty much eliminate a lot of your overwintering insects. You can, in my view, do a modified fall cleanup. Uh, certainly, the Xerces Society is, as keeps saying, leave the leaves. I would say leave at least some of the leaves, leave them in your uh, flower beds, leave them in the woods if you're lucky enough to have a nice wooded area, or move them to an out of the way location. Um, certainly if there are cocoons in there and you just move them uh, gently, <laughs> then um, they will survive. If you wanna shed, shred them uh, because they make better mulch on ground, uh, I think that's fine. You're, you know, you have to be sensible, uh, use common sense, as Ptolemy has said. You, know, you don't have to be a purist about it. Certainly, you want to leave at least most of your perennial stems until spring. Now, I admit, <clears throat> this is my uh, bed back in October. The joke highweed was hiding all this lovely fall color that you see here. And so I did chop down the joe pie weed, a lot of it but I did leave some stems sticking up, so maybe the bees will find them next year. So again, uh, but most of the perennial stems, I think they look nice in the winter, um, particularly the few case occasions that we get snow. Um, I mentioned flowers throughout the season. This is very important, especially for overwintering insects in the early spring. So things like red bud and other tree flowers, um, various other spring flowers. Of course, in the summer, you're going to have uh, insects requiring uh, nectar and pollen as well. And then in the fall, so you'll see lots and lots of insects preparing for overwintering or migrating. Provide ground cover under trees. Now on the right, we have a lovely oak tree. And if you're familiar with Doug Tallamy's books, uh, oaks uh, provide foliage that's fit, fed on by many, many species of native uh, caterpillars. That's all well and good, but if underneath the oak, all you have is very closely mowed grass, many, many of those insects are gonna be come down and try to find a place to pupate and perhaps a place to overwinter. And they're going to be uh, done for. If they can't make it to those woods in the back, um, they're, they're not gonna survive. So yes, there are some that will overwinter in the tree uh, such as polyphemus moth that I've shown, but many, many will be looking for protected area. You can plant uh, native ground covers as shown on the left, uh, the wild ginger. You can leave at least a circle of mulch with leaves in it underneath the tree, just something for them to, to survive on. You should, as best you can, preserve dead trees, branches, logs, and stumps. Now, obviously this is not always possible, but as you see on the right here, beetles, carpenter ants burrow into dead wood and provide these lovely chambers for cavity nesting bees to lay their eggs and also protected winter sites for many, many different species. Preserve your trees that have bark flaps. Lots and lots of insects will be looking for a place to overwinter under the bark. And in the winter, you'll see woodpeckers going up and down your trees uh, and they do seek out and find some of these insects. So you're providing winter food as well. And then finally, if you can, build a brush pile. Now this is obviously not the most beautiful thing, but again, if you have a wooded area or an out of the way area, uh, small mammals will create burrows under this brush pile. Again, when they're abandoned, perfect place for a bumblebee nest. Ground nesting bees uh, may nest underneath there and then <clears throat> also shelter for overwintering insects. And then eventually this will break down into valuable organic matter. So in conclusion, this nice picture from the uh, Forest Service shows a lot of the things that I've been talking about, ways that you can uh, change your, your uh, landscape to make it more um, conducive for survival of insects throughout the season. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. I have a couple of questions that we're, we're waiting, I was waiting to ask. One of, one of them is, how do you close off one end of the stalk that's going to be bundled for insect use? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> I'm not really sure about that. Um, 
let's see. When we, um, I did a workshop with somebody from the Xerxes Society at Mount Cuba. And what she had us do was take straws and put them in a, a container, uh, something like something that chips would come in, you know, Pringles and put them in a container like that. And that way all the, the one end is, is blocked off and then you can put it sideways under your deck if you have one or in a protected area. And, and another question from Paula, we have carpenter bees near our fence each year, but noticed a marked decrease in bees in general last year. Was this seen by anyone else or just us? Uh, you know, I, there weren't a huge number of insects around in my, experience last summer. I don't know in general. I don't know if anybody else has anything to share about that, but I, you know, it, it was speculated that perhaps be, because we had such a cool spring last year, may, that may have slowed things down a bit. There weren't a whole lot of butterflies, but again, a lot of these populations are cyclic. And so um, you can't necessarily think, well, that's the end of them. Um, and one question that goes way back, um, what what was the butterfly that decimated the asters? Uh, well, the caterpillars uh, on the asters, that's it, the pearly crescent. Pearly crescent. Okay, when, great. When you say decimated, you know, I, I have not seen them decimating asters. Uh, they're, they're, they're pretty tiny, but I, I can imagine that could happen. And it's one other quick question about any comments regarding cicada killers. This may be a lower Delaware thing, but is there a difference between a moth or a miller? Uh, well, cicada killers are wasps. They're not, they're not moths or millers or moths as well. So what cicada killers, they're very, very large wasps and um, they're kind of terrifying looking. Uh, but what they do is they come out as adults when um, cicadas are present they will build burrows, kind of similar to what the ground nesting bees do, capture a cicada, drag it back to that burrow, and um, lay an egg on it. They paralyze it with a sting, lay an egg on it, and, uh, and then that egg will develop again for a full year in that burrow in the soil until the next year when cicada killers will come out as adults again. Now, people are scared of them and they can be kind of scary, but it's usually the, the males that are highly territorial and aggressive and the males can't sting. So, um, you know, most of the time the females are, are, are involved in collecting cicadas, rearing their young and so on and not trying to sting people. Judy, but, Sally, I'm gonna interrupt quickly. Um, I see that some folks are leaving. First, I wanna say thank you to Judy. That was an excellent presentation and I learned a lot. And you can see in the chat that so many others have compliments for you. So thank you so much.